Hello, everyone. Welcome. Time is now 1230 Eastern Time, uh, 930 Pacific, and we're ready to jump in with this Mapbox webinar, Harnessing the Power of Climate Data with Probable Futures and Mapbox. Uh, so I'm, I'm joined today by Peter Crochet. Uh, Peter, if you want to say hello. And um, hello. Peter is, yeah, hello. Peter is the product lead at Probable Futures. Probable Futures is a nonprofit climate literacy initiative that makes practical tools, stories, and resources available to everyone online everywhere. And uh, part of those resources include data, and part of that data includes spatial data, uh, which we're going to see in action today, um, to see how you can actually take the take that data and make it into something uh, useful for humans uh, via your Mapbox products or via your website. Um, so that's what we're going to be covering today. Uh, I'll do a couple of quick slides before we jump in. Um, if you're here, you're probably already familiar with Mapbox, um, but if you're if you're not, you know, completely aware of our product offering, uh, we offer a full complement of location-based services. Uh, anything you need to power mapping and location and navigation uh, and location-based search in your apps. Uh, we also have data products that are complementary to that suite, um, but are often useful on their own. So those of you who are joining uh, just in the interest of, you know, analyzing and making use of data, um, we also may have some interesting data sets that you might want to check out for things like traffic and boundaries. Um, this is also a plug right now to join the Mapbox Developer Discord community. Uh, it's actually got over 6,000 users and, and constantly growing, um, but would be a great place for you to share uh, anything you end up working on with the um, with the, the techniques and tools and data sets you're going to hear about today, and would also be a wonderful place to uh, to get help if you are Im end up implementing this sort of this sort of approach. So uh, go ahead and check out the Discord server. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter, um, who's going to uh, tell us all about the spatial data offerings and APIs, et cetera, for climate data that Probable Futures has to offer. So take it away, Peter. Great. Thanks a lot, Chris. All right. Share. And if I can say one more thing while he's sharing, uh, be sure to drop your questions into the chat. I'll be moderating a bit. So if there's a question, um, I'll find a good time to to ask that question and make sure it gets in front of Peter and um, yeah, just uh, make make use of the chat. We'll see you in there. Okay, take it away, Peter. Cool, thanks, Chris. Can you all see this? Probable futures on the screen? Yep, looks great. Great. All right, so as Chris said, I am Peter Croce and I'm product lead at Probable Futures. So I have the privilege to get to work with some very talented people to make some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. And we're going to do a deep dive into probable futures data and how to use it and what it's good for. But first, what even is probable futures here? So the world is changing, right? We see more heat and storms, flooding, drought, and wildfires. You might see it in the news, and you might see it in your life. It's natural to have questions about this. Questions like, what will climate change really mean for me and my communities and the people and places that I depend on? And in practical terms, how will we live in a changing world? And what will be different? How might we live well? So at Probable Futures, we saw a way to offer answers to these questions. We're talking maps of weather patterns in different probable scenarios covering the whole world right down to the local level where you live. So Probable Futures is a nonprofit climate literacy initiative and we make practical tools and educational resources available online for everyone, everywhere. And we really mean everyone. We work with various different communities and governments, businesses and individuals, because we all need to prepare for the climate changes that we're experiencing now, the futures that are likely and coming soon. And we need to work to avoid the futures that carry the most profound risks that are farther out. So how do we actually do that? So at Probable Futures, we everything we do is between education and data. And today we're gonna to be focusing on the stuff on the far right side, integrations and open data. But at Probable Futures, we do a lot of other things and please feel free to check out probablefutures.org to learn much more about that. So on the integrations and open data side, today we'll be talking about embeddable maps, Mapbox tile sets and styles, our API that you can use to get data, uh, data for download if you want to use the raw data and download it, and our developer documentation. So you can learn all about all this stuff in much more depth than we'll 
talk about today. So who's actually using this data? So supply chain, public health, law and liability, disaster preparedness, climate change affects all industries and sectors. So it's being used in a really wide variety of different ways and in different industries and sectors. And we also collaborate with people in finance and consulting companies, civic organizations. We do training for elected officials. We work with culture organizations like organizations in Hollywood, film studios, streaming and production companies um, to bring different stories about the climate um, to those companies um, and the things that they create. And on the education side, uh, we do executive trainings and higher education um, trainings. And uh, we're in K through 12 schools. So we've partnered with people and collaborated with people um, to bring this education into many different areas. So people are using this data, but what is it? Let's take a look at one of these maps. And this is of course a map box map, and this is a probable futures map. And here in particular, we're looking at the change in snowy days. So change in snowy days, and you can see there's a key on the bottom left that may be hard to read, but um, I'm gonna stop the GIF, um, just one degree of warming here. Um, the GIF is moving through different warming scenarios. So all of our maps have uh, different warming scenarios and you can see those at the top here. So 0.5 degrees of warming, one degree of warming is selected now. And so there's six different scenarios and each of these show very different world. And in this case, it's showing uh, difference in change in snowy days in different warming scenarios. And you can see that um, by following the key, the yellow areas are a loss of um, snowy days. And that is what we would expect with warming, right? Uh, but you can really see in particular down to the local level what the change in snowy days is with a map like this. So where does this data actually come from? Scientists have built models of the earth over the last many decades, climate scientists, to understand what the weather would be like in different places in different warming scenarios. And when they do this work, they're just trying to figure out if the earth warms by say one degree on average, what will the weather be like? How about if it warms by 1.5 degrees C or two degrees C? And they do this by dividing the atmosphere into these boxes like this diagram here. And they call these boxes grid cells. So the size of the grid cells determines the resolution of the map that you get as a result. And our maps at Probable Futures have a size of 22 kilometers per side of the square. And so that gives you a resolution that you can use for very practical decisions because 22 kilometers squared is about the size of a town or a city. And when you're talking about a climate, um, you really care about the way the weather will be in a city. You, you don't care about um, the way the weather will be at your house and your neighbor's house because it's gonna be the same. Um, so this resolution is very practical and useful um, for making decisions. So where does this data actually come from? Like who actually makes it? So the people who have been developing the data like this um, over many decades are in research labs and universities around the world. And this map shows where these model centers are for the data that we use. Uh, there are about uh, over two dozen of these modeling centers from the data that we use, uh, which is called Cortex Core. And they all develop their own independent models of the world. And then they combine those models together. And so you get something that is this, they call it an ensemble, or it's all that data together. Um, and then that's a useful model that combines um, all of those models together. And that's what we use. So now that we understand a little bit about where the data comes from, let's set some context for climate change. This may seem like a funny question at first. Why did it take so long to create the first world maps? But it actually did take a long time. See, people like you and I have been around for about 200,000 years, but it wasn't until about 12,000 years ago that we had the first known human settlements. And curiously, these all emerged in different places and on different continents all over the world, seemingly disconnected, but at the same time. And it wasn't until almost 10,000 years later 
that the first known world map emerged. I found this on Wikipedia, the first known world map. And then in 2020, 2010, uh, Mapbox was founded. So it took a very long time for us to get to this point where we have these digital maps that we're using. So why didn't humans settle before 12,000 years ago? Well, it turns out it's because the climate wasn't stable. So this is a graph of the history of climate on Earth. And specifically, it's a graph of the global average temperature compared to the global average temperature before the climate started to warm. So compared to the global average temperature of 1850 to 1900. And the way you can read this graph is the closer the line is to zero, the closer the global average temperature was to that stable temperature before the climate started to change. So we can think about what humans were doing at different points along this graph. And we know that humans like us have been around for about 200,000 years. And for about 90% of that time, or 180,000 years, we were nomadic. We lived by hunting and gathering. And looking at this chart, we can get a sense for why. Because a climate that changes dramatically like this, the way it moves up and down like this, is just not good for settling in one place because the nice places don't stay nice for long. But a climate that is stable the way it was starting about 10,000 years ago or about 12,000 years ago um, is very good for settling in one place. So we can label these and we can call this blue area the human existence temperature band and the green area the human civilization temperature band because that's what people were doing at these different times. So this green band here is what enabled us to settle and stay in one place for long periods of time. And initially, by staying in one place, people were able to create agriculture. You may have heard about this, the agricultural revolution. They were able to do that because the climate stabilized. But then, extraordinarily, as had never happened before, the climate continued staying stable for much longer. And so people built persistent cultures and cities in places with nice weather and other natural resources. And eventually they created governments and shared infrastructure like roads and sewers and plumbing and also libraries and knowledge that could accumulate over time that enabled drawing of maps of the world, for example. And with that, they were able to create industry to build at a far faster pace than they ever did before. And then finally, on top of all of that, they were able to create useful abstractions like software and map box and modern financial systems of exchange. So because a stable climate has been assumed in every aspect of our society, our food systems and our communities, our cultures, our government, our infrastructure and industry, all of this is built on patterns of a stable climate. There was a there was a quick question uh, about is there anything you can say about what actually prompted that change that happened that really important uh, change in the graph ten thousand years ago? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I probably am not um, I'm not a climate scientist myself. I'm probably not well equipped to answer that. Um, I think there are, there are lots of studies on that, and that's something that I'm sure I could um, dig something up, talk to the climate scientists on our team, and share out. But I'm. I'm more of a product person. I'm, I'm not the best one to ask about that, but good question. So it actually turns out that the climate of civilization was perfect for humans. This place that it stabilized was, was perfect for humans. So there were large expanses of temperate land and stable seasonal patterns and nowhere was too hot for the human body. So what exactly does it mean to be too hot for the human body? Like it is here, it's very hot here where I am. Well, for that, we need to learn about wet bulb temperature. Many people have learned about um, different kinds of temperature, like heat index, uh, but there's other kinds of temperature like wet bulb temperature that measures heat and humidity. Um, and this is, it can be many different combinations of heat and humidity. And you can see on this chart that you can have uh, a wet bulb temperature of 32 degrees C with 100% humidity or other combinations. 
of that. But you're gonna be hearing more about this because as the climate warms, um, air can hold, uh, warm air can hold more water. So you get more of this humidity with heat. And so we are mammals that need to give off heat to the environment around us. And if we can't sweat to give off that heat because the air around us isn't cool or dry enough to evaporate that sweat, then we overheat. And so you can get people who experience, and you've probably heard about this in heat waves where people are experiencing heat stroke or something very extreme. And that's where we get these danger, um, dangerous levels of heat and humidity. And so we can actually go back to the maps and we can see that in a past climate here, we're looking at 0.5 degrees of warming. So this is a past climate between the years of 1970 and 2000. Um, you can see that basically nowhere was too hot for the human body. So you can see that zero is the gray color and it's showing that nowhere was too hot for the human body in this past climate. So each of these maps begin with a past climate so that you can orient yourself and say, okay, what is the climate that we are used to? And here you can see that in a past climate, we didn't have days above 32 degrees C wet bulbs. So we are adapted for that as large mammals. Let's take a look at another map and see the past climate. Uh, so here we're looking at a map of freezing days. So days that are completely below freezing. In many places in the past, there were enough freezing days that you could store water as snow and ice in the winter, or it would naturally be stored as snow and ice. And then it would melt uh, in the warmer months. And so you would have this continuous stream of water. And that's very useful for providing consistent water throughout the year. There are many other patterns like this. But let's go back to this chart now. And if we look back even farther in history, way back here in the many millions of years in the past, we can see that a stable climate is actually pretty unusual because the earth has been much hotter than humans have ever experienced in the past. If you look all the way back here, like 60 million years ago, that's when reptile, large reptiles like dinosaurs lived. Um, and so it was too hot for large mammals um, to live above water. Only insects and small mammals lived back then. And so we can label this again, and we have green for human civilization, blue for human existence, and before that, there were no people. But now if we look at the right side of the graph, we can see that the temperature today is now breaking out of that human civilization temperature band. And if humans continue, continue emitting as much into the atmosphere as we do today, we will break out of the human existence temperature band, break out of that, that blue band. And so seeing that graph helps us understand that climate change isn't just about warmer temperatures, but about losing stability. It shows that we've actually never maintained civilization in an unstable climate before. And so living well in the future will depend on different skills like preparation, adaptation, and resilience. And we can use these maps for that purpose. Fortunately, we do have these maps. It's kind of extraordinary that we know the way the world will be in different warming scenarios, right? And with this, we can plan for the warming that's coming that we know is definitely going to come and motivate society to avoid further levels of warming that would bring further destabilization. So with these maps, we can develop a keen awareness of the climate to guide our preparation to live in this changing world. So let's look at more maps, right? So here we have a map of days above 32 degrees C or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this one is not wet bulbs, so just raw temperature. I'm gonna move a little more quickly now and move through the warming scenarios so you can just see how it expands as you move through. Let's look at another one. So here we have uh, days above 28 degrees C or 82 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulbs. So this is 100% humidity. Um, this would be the air temperature in the shade. Uh, and so it's very hard for the human body to cool off um, if you know even in the shade, it's so hot and so humid. This particular um, 82, de uh, 82 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb 
um, temperature. You can see it really happened in very few places in the past. So pink here is showing where it was common, where it was over two weeks per year in an average year in the past. And you can see that very few places have pink there. Um, and so it was pretty rare to occur in the past. But if you move through the warming scenarios, you can see that those pink colors expand. All right, so this is a map of extreme drought. Extreme drought is defined as a very dry period with only a 5% chance of happening in a past climate. So it's like the 5% of the driest um, chance in a, in a place. And it is specific to different places because different places um, are adapted to different amounts of water. You know, some places are very wet and some are drier. So this measure drought, um, whenever you talk about drought anywhere, not just our maps, drought is a specific measure. And so if we look at this, we can see that, that at one degree of warming, this extreme drought measure becomes much more common around the world. You can see that the green means 11% to 20%, and it's expanding to many places around the world. Um, just one note here, places that are already desert um, we have just removed the data for that because talking about drought in a desert um, doesn't make a lot of sense. It's already, there's so little water there. So we've just removed the data there because um, it can give you very bright colors with very small changes, which is doesn't make a big difference for actual life there in those places. And with these changing conditions, if some place changes to something that is so much drier, it can become a completely different environment than what it was before. So as we move through these warming scenarios and we start to see some of these oranges or these reds, um, this orange color means over 50% chance of extreme drought. In conditions like that, you have an extreme drought uh, every other year, at least, you know, 50% chance. And so in that situation, it's going to be a very, very different climate. And so you may need different um, adaptations, different plants, different agriculture, all those kinds of things. So let's look at another map. And these are dynamic map box maps, of course, so you can zoom in. And here we're looking at Hyderabad in Pakistan. And you can see that with this measure, we're looking at days above 30 degrees C or 86 Fahrenheit wet bulb. So this heat and humidity combination. It really didn't happen in an average year in Hyderabad in um, in the past, we're looking at 0.5 here. And in a warmer year, uh, it did happen, but just for one, one day in a warmer year, because we know that some years are different, some years are warmer than others. But if we move through these warming scenarios, it starts to expand quite quickly. So this heat and humidity combination in this place is expanding quite a lot. And at 1.5 now, in a warmer year, it's 23 days, you know, or over three weeks, this thing that was happening um, for one day in a warmer year in a past climate. At two degrees now, it's expanded quite a lot more. 2.5, it's now well over a month in a warmer year, two weeks in an average year. And at three degrees in an average year, it is almost a month and in a warmer year over two months. So. This is a very different place and it requires very different adaptations to live here. Let's turn now to the US. So much of the U, uh, much of California in the US um, and much of uh, the Western US is a desert. So where does the water come from? It actually comes from snowpack. So if you live in this area, you may think about snowpack and hear about snowpack in the news. Um, and you need this snowpack to provide water for the spring and summer. There are other parts of the world that experience this too, but that's a big deal in the Western US. So if this water, the snowpack, if it melts too fast, it can cause flooding. And then later, there's not enough water. So high temperatures like these, like days above 32 degrees C or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, we'd say in the US, um, that can cause this melting very quickly. You know, And so at these high altitudes, temperatures like these were pretty uncommon, You know, just a couple of days per year uh, in an average year. But if you move through the warming scenarios, again, you see that 
it expands quite a lot. And so you could really get more, you would expect to get more of these melting events. And so the future is usually portrayed in one of two ways. One where climate change is solved and the world is essentially exactly the same, but with more electric cars, and one where there is perpetual apocalypse. But these maps help us see that number one is no longer possible. We can see that the future will be different than the past, and it will require some different skills and adaptations. But number two is avoidable and a ways off. Also in these maps, we can see that it's not going to Mad Max. You know, it's not going to just be this apocalypse all of a sudden. And so we need to prepare for these probable futures that are in between. And one thing is clear here, life under a changing climate will be different, but different in what ways? That's up to us. So now is the time when we can imagine and design a future that both works with this new paradigm of a changing climate and that limits the rate and extent of that change. And so now let's get into the actual demo and look at how do we use these maps? And I see that there's some, some questions in the chat too. So if there's anything that I should address at this point, um, please feel free to call it out. I, I think the, yeah, the couple of questions were about just what are the time frames on this? And I think it's meant to be, uh, if, well, I won't, I won't speak for you, but it sounds like, you know, you're speaking in terms of uh, scenarios and the timing on them is not, definite it's not you know it's not a hundred percent but i think you can allude that you know certain things are more likely to happen sooner than than others right that is a great question yeah and so if you i'll go now to our live maps this is a great way to look at this um, and i'll drop a link to this in the chat so everyone can follow along because these these are public so if you look at these scenarios in the live maps, you can click on this info button and you can get information about when that is to be expected. So we can see that uh, one degree C we actually passed in 2017. So we now are experiencing 1.2 degrees of warming about. 1.5, you click on this, you can see that 1.5 is coming pretty soon. So we need to be prepared for 1.5. But these, these degrees that are farther out, these warming scenarios farther out, are labeled potential. These don't necessarily need to happen, or they can be pushed off uh, for a long time. They could be, um, we could slow the rate at which we get to these, which would allow us to adapt and prepare. And so you can see that these, you could make estimates based on current um, emissions, but what people do changes. And so that's why we talk in these warming scenarios rather than talking in years, uh, because we have control over that as people. We can control how much um, emissions we continue putting out into the world. Good question. So I'm going to go back and let's start doing the demo and actually get into some code and how this stuff works. So first, let's look at embeddable maps. And then we're going to get into the rest of this stuff here too. So with embeddable maps, I'm going to go back to the live site and you all can follow along and do this with me as well. This is the easiest way to get a probable futures map to use on your own website or in your own app. Um, this is just one click to download an embeddable map. So I'm going to go to a particular place. Say I want to tell a story about Cairo in Egypt. And I'm going to look at um, this map, which is days above 32. And I'm going to go to this download here. And now I could download a QR code that would share this map, this link to this particular place in this warming scenario. But right now I want to get an embeddable map. So I can download this. Now I have this file, HTML file, that I can then put on any server, on any website. And if you have you know, a website where you can drop in an HTML file to embed a file, you can embed it there. And this will give you a map of that place and that warming scenario that you were looking at when you clicked that. You can also get an embeddable comparison map. This is useful for comparing between different warming scenarios. And this actually uses a Mapbox package um, that we were able to inherit and then modify for our use. So, I'm going to compare 0.5 
uh, degrees, past climate, to two degrees. Let's see how those two would look. I'm going to open up this file again that I just downloaded. And now you can see I have this comparison map. So I can see the difference between the data in these two different scenarios. And you can see that it's labeled 0.5 and 2 there. So anywhere that you zoom into with these embeddable maps, it's going to give you a map of that place. So you could zoom in very far and you could look there. Um, and so you can get a map of a place. You can also, with this, you can click to inspect the data as you can do here on our maps as well. And so if you click to inspect the data, um, you can swipe across and you can see how the data changes in a particular place. So if I were telling a story about Cairo, I might wanna click there. Oops, and I would wanna grab this and I could swipe back and forth. All right, so that is embeddable maps. Any questions there? Oh yeah, thanks for sharing the, the plugin, Chris. All right, so what if you want to develop something more custom? You wanna actually use the Mapbox tile sets that we've created? Well, for that, you can go to our documentation and I'll share a link to this in the chat. And you can follow this quick start guide to get started. You can also do a lot of custom stuff, but I'll follow this guide because it's a quick way to get started and good for a demo. So I'm gonna to go to Mapbox Studio. And this is just, I've just created an account here. There's nothing special that I've set up in this account. And I'm gonna create a new style. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna grab a style JSON from here. So just to show what I did there, in the first step here, I clicked Map Styles folder in GitHub. And now it goes to our GitHub and I'm gonna download some styles for let's look at the 10 hottest days. I'm just gonna download this JSON. That's downloaded. I'm gonna upload a new style. Upload that style, click customize to continue. And now I have this map loaded up in Mapbox Studio. It's referencing our public tile sets and all the styles here um, that we have selected are here, but you can also change these styles if you want the color and all that. You can also see if you look at how the styles are being applied with this expression, um, which by the way, you can find all of our um, details about our expressions and our maps here in our documentation, but um, you can see that it's coloring the data for one degree C of warming in the mid, uh, it's coloring the mid value. So what does that mean? So we see that there are three pieces of data for every grid cell. On our maps here, we apply color for the mid value here, which is average on this map. But if you wanted to create a map that showed what a warm year would be like all over the world, you could change this mid value to say hi. And the syntax is detailed in our um, documentation. And once that loads, you'll see now it's applying color for the high value in a one degrees C warming scenario, or I could look at 1.5 to use underscores instead of periods here, or change that to 2.5. So you really have complete customization and you can change the colors. You know, you can add and remove anything here. And then of course you can make globe, globe maps with these very cool globe maps that Mapbox has created. So there's a lot you can do with Mapbox Studio. Yes, a real world use case for expressions. Yes, that's right. Overlay the red plus project boundaries with this data. Great question, yes. So. Let's move to uh, let's move to this part actually. So that will answer uh, Sean's question about overlaying data. So we have this application called Probable Futures Pro, which anyone can get access to. We do ask for registration, 
And I will, I'll share a link to this um, so you all can request to join if you'd like. On this page, you will find a link to an Airtable where you can request to join. Uh, but let's go back to this and I'll, I'll show how to overlay data. So with Probable Futures Pro, uh, what we did was create um, the same maps that we have publicly, all the same maps, um, but with the ability to overlay data on top. And so here I've overlaid data with world cities, but you can overlay any data that you would like and combine those and see those. So if, if Sean, if you have data for um, red plus project boundaries, um, you could you could overlay those here and you could look at like, how would carbon offsets be affected by a changing climate? What, what maybe trees should be planted in a changing climate in different places? Uh, so one, one thing you can do here to get started, if you don't have your own data, but you just wanna see how this works, uh, you can say power plants. We have an example data set here and click on example data set. And I'm going to select power plants, but we have a couple others that are open source data that we've just found online. Um, it needs to be geospatial data that has like latitude and longitude or that has city and country or some other way. Uh, and then you can click import data set. Now it's importing power plants all around the world from this power plant data set uh, CSV that we found online. Now you have them overlaid uh, with um, with the climate data. And then with this, you can actually um, enrich what, what's called kind of enriching or combining these into one. Uh, and then with that, you can drag these and say, okay, maybe I want to know where the power plants are that are going to experience a certain number of days above 32 degrees C or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, because I know that that will be problematic for power plants or whatever the data set is that you upload. And you can view only those data sets that will experience uh, certain conditions or those, those power plants in this case that will experience certain conditions. So that's Probable Futures Pro. Uh, Peter, real quick, there's, uh, there's yeah. a question. Somebody asked a question in the Q&A section, which is not actually in the chat, but um, I, I don't think anyone can answer it except you or me uh, via the actual Q&A widget here in Zoom, um, but maybe, uh, I, I'm not sure if everyone can read it, but maybe if everyone can, some one of your colleagues, uh, probable futures, can answer. But it's about basically is it's about uh, it's asking whether there's higher resolution uh, that, for example, a biologist could use to predict the presence and movement of animals or viruses. Um, so basically, is is higher resolution data available? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so higher resolution climate data than this actually begins to have diminishing returns because. Um, the weather in one place will be the same for you know the surrounding area. So our data is 22 kilometers uh, squared approximately. And so if you have higher resolution data than this, and you're talking about how many days above 32 or um, what the likelihood of year plus drought will be, or whether there will be um, more snow or less snow there or rainstorms or that kind of thing, all of these kinds of weather and climate effects, um, really it's not gonna give you much more to have uh, higher resolution data than this because the weather in one place is going to be the same, um, you know, for your neighbor and, and the neighbor next, you know, so all of this weather data really, um, it's, it's best when it's, it, you, you could have it be higher resolution, but it wouldn't be very useful. It would be diminishing returns. Somebody just asked, what is the resolution which you just said, but they missed? I think you said 22 kilometers square is each one of the yeah. uh, grid squares you were seeing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 22 kilometers squared about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's actually 0. 0.2 um, degrees latitude and longitude, but that we don't usually think in latitude and longitude. It comes out to about 22 kilometers squared. So let's take a look at how to use the Probable Futures API. So I'm going to...
open up hopscotch. Okay, so hopscotch, this is a lot like Postman if you've ever used uh, Postman as an API client. And it's just a browser-based version of that. So I'm gonna use this and I'm gonna pull up our documentation to look at how to access the API. First, I need an access token, um, which you can request through the same link uh, that I shared before to request access to Probable Futures Pro. You can also request access to the API that way and I'll share an API key with you. So first you request an access token and get that token. So I'm gonna do that here. Get a token that I can use for 24 hours. Bring that over, put that in my request, connect, and then I can run a query to get back a response. But what happened here with this query? So in the API documentation, we can see that there are parameters I can provide, location data, so I can request latitude um, and longitude of, of a location, the data for a location, um, or city and country, or a particular address. Um, I can provide a warming scenario and a data set ID to get back data for a particular um, map. And so what I've done is I've requested data for uh, this ID, which I actually forget which one I had pulled up here, but if I go back over here and I look at our maps, I could choose an ID for days above 32, and I can put in that ID. And now I've requested data for Salt Lake City in a 2.5 degree warming scenario, and I've requested the mid value, uh, but I could also request the mid value and the high value too. If I wanna see what it would be like um, in a warm year there. So I can click run. And I can change that location too. So it says Salt Lake City here is what I'm requesting, but I could change this to like New York City. I could run that and that would give me the results for New York. And this does geocoding for you uh, using the Mapbox geocoding API. And then it will return the data for that particular location. Hey, quick That's question. Awesome. Quick question from yeah. me, Peter. Those uh, those data set IDs you just showed, like a a table that had all the like, I guess the answer key for all these. Are those based on? Are those just your IDs that you guys came up with, or is that is there some other standard somewhere that exists for all these different metrics? Just curious. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's our standard that we came up with, and you can learn more about it in our data set inventory here, which is linked in the docs. Um, so what I clicked on there on this maps page, there's a link to the data set inventory. And it details how those um, how those work. So the, the ID scheme here has one tab that explains that the model is the first digit. So what model was used to create the data there. Um, the category is the second digit. So we have categories for increasing heat, decreasing cold, heat and humidity. These are the same categories that you can see in the drop down here increasing heat, decreasing cold, heat, and humidity. Um, and then the last uh, fourth and fifth digits are the data set um, number ID. And so we just created a scheme that has some meaning behind it. So you can look at that ID and know what you're looking at. And that's why they, uh, that's why they look that way. Good question. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so that's the API. Um, let's take a quick look at how to download the data directly. So if you want to download the data, just the raw data, get it in CSV form, you can do that too. Again, hey, we had, I'm, I'm sorry to yeah. cut you off one more time, but before you move on, there was a quick question about uh, APIs before you jump into this. And it was, uh, the request was, can you get data for an entire country? I'm, I'm gonna think that it's based on uh, just point coordinates, but, um, but yeah, that, can you get a country data? Yeah, that's a great question. Not in the API, and we haven't set that up because that would be pretty intensive of a request because these are pretty 
pretty high resolution data sets. There's a lot of data in each of these, um, but you can do exactly that when you download data. So if you go here to the data sets tab in Probable Futures Pro, and you scroll down past data sets you've uploaded, you probably won't have as many as me because I always use this as a demo. Um, but here in the Probable Futures data side, you can download data for let's say 32 degrees C, and you can download for a particular country. So I'm not sure what country um, this person who asked was interested in, but um, let's say I just want the, the data for Afghanistan. And so if I download that, um, I can also select if I want only the low values, mid values, high values, um, or if I want the polygon coordinates for the grid cell, and then you can just download it. It will process it live in the browser. So it's creating the file that will have only the data for Afghanistan there. Um, oh, great. I see Scott says that, that will work. Cool. Um, and so once that is done downloading, then the file will download. It is a little faster to just download the, the data um, directly. Um, data um, is already downloading uh, because it, it doesn't need to create the file for you. Uh, but um, yeah, that's how that's working. So that is it for that is it for my demo. Uh, oh, there it goes. Just downloaded. Mm -hmm. So that's a CSV file. Um, so that's it for my demo. If you have questions, if you need help getting started, uh, oh, file just opened, uh, please reach out. This is my email and our docs link is here. Our website is here. There's lots more to learn on the website. Uh, we have a full educational experience on probablefutures.org, uh, complete with a video and audio. You can listen to it and Happy to help with any of your implementations or experiments. How often do you update the underlying data with new model output? Good question. Uh, so the models that we use are updated every few years, um, not very often because the climate data, the models of, of the climate don't change super often. Um, they are quite uh, reliable, even in forward looking ways. And so they don't need to change very often, um, but we do update our data when new data sets have come out, um, like CMIP6, for instance, and uh, when that data has been widely accepted and tested by the scientific community, because sometimes data will come out, but then it will be widely used and tested and people will notice that certain parts of it are not reliable. So we like to make sure that um, data has been widely tested and used um, for a little while before we integrate it. So in short, every couple of years. Um, well, others are, ha we, we still have some more time for questions. Um, so if anyone else has them, please jump them in the chat or drop them in the chat. Uh, I'll, I'll just want to interject with one quick observation um, and just to celebrate, you know, what we, uh, what Peter went over very quickly uh, when showing these Mapbox data sets, but um, effectively, they've, they, effectively they've taken this like this global data set of these 22 kilometer square regions and made it available uh, instantly for mapping. And usually, if you have spatial data, it still takes uh, quite a few steps to like make that data available before it can be you know put onto a global web map uh, because it has to be tiled. Um, so effectively, they're you know Probable Futures is publishing these in a tile ready uh, or as tile sets, so they're ready for mapping. Um, and you, it kind of cuts out that initial step of processing and publishing uh, a map ready data set. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and it looks like someone just dropped a question and said, uh, what new scenarios are you considering adding? Oh, yeah, good question. We, we think a lot about that. What other kinds of maps would be useful for people? We're looking now at heat waves. Um, so periods of um, over average temperature heat that come in, in a wave, you know, we're looking at adding maps like that, and we're always looking at adding more data that would be useful. So if there are particular things that you're working on or concerned about um, that you think would be useful to have, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we welcome suggestions. Bleaching incidents. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't do um, ocean data in particular, but um, that's, yeah, great suggestion. Good to hear. 
uh, just to make sure everyone's understood, you said bleaching incidents, but I don't. I think people viewing this may not be able to see the chat. Uh, to make sure oh. we're talking about coral bleaching there, right? I think so. Yeah, there was a question about bleaching, um, which I think means coral bleaching here. And yeah, I was just saying we we don't do ocean data. Um, we do uh, just climate climate model data. But yeah, that's a very important thing too. It's a good question. Awesome. Any other questions? How long does it take to get the requests for accessing pro features approved? Um, good question. Uh, kind of depends on how busy we are, I guess. And uh, we do have a Slack group, actually, of we call it the Probable Futures Data Community. So we have people in there who request features. And if you'd like to join that, um, you, you can you can go to that link I shared earlier of um, probablefutures.org slash pro. You can request access to join. And part of this request, uh, you'll actually then get access to that Slack community. And you can request or um, sh also share things that you're working on there. So people have joined that and shared many different things that they've created. Uh, someone actually created a telegram, telegram bot. bot. Um, so the chat app telegram um you they created a bot that they called probable futures bot that uses the probable futures api and um and then that actually also uses um, a python library that someone else in the group created and contributed to our open source repositories um, and so yeah there's this community of people building stuff um that telegram bot in particular is kind of fun um or interesting, you can you can send it a message of your location. So send the message to the bot and say, I'm in New York City or something, and then it will send back climate data to you in a text message format using the, the Probable Futures API. Looks like there was another question about someone saying, what is the accuracy of the model? What is the certainty of these climate predictions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so. Over time, uh, as the Earth has warmed more, we have seen that climate models have been quite reliable at predicting the way the world will be. And so it's a, it's a very good measure of how the world will be. Um, that said, there's a lot to read, um, which we actually make all public on our science page, about all the dis different nuances about how these models work. So it looks like this page is just loading, but if you go to probablefutures.org slash science, um, that has a whole lot of information about um, how to interpret the data, um, where the, the data is trained on, so places that have had more weather stations in the past, for instance, um, then there's more data about those places. So there's a lot of nuance that you can get into there um, on probablefutures.org. Um, slash science. And I think uh, there was one last question. Actually, they keep coming in, but uh, here's one about somebody asking if there will be data sets related to typhoons and cyclones, uh, and I guess hurricanes get thrown into that group as well, um, real time or historical. Is that something you guys plan on covering at some point? That's a good question. Yeah, we do storms. Uh, we do one in 100 year storms, but we don't do uh, hurricanes or typhoons. Um, and so, yeah, we, we don't have plans to do those now, but we, uh, we do have one in 100 year storms. And so those can give you an idea of changing precipitation amounts related to large storms. I can show you an example of that. So if you go to change in frequency, of a historical one in 100 year storm. This can show you how a past one in 100 year storm will increase in frequency. So for instance, if you see that it will have a 2x increase, then you could expect it um, every 50 years. Now, this is one of the maps that we have related to that. Um, if you see 3x, then one in every 33 years or so. Um, but we also have change in precipitation of a one in 100 year storm. And so that looks at, okay, what storm will come one in 100 years now? 
maybe it's bigger or maybe it's smaller in this changed climate, how much bigger will it be or how much smaller will it be? And so this shows an increase in millimeters uh, of rain that comes from that storm. So this can give you a, a good sense of how storms are changing around the world. All right, and actually we have a technical question now um, that says, you know, these data, well, it says weather data sets, but I assume they're just kind of comparing your, your global data set here to weather data sets. Um, they can be very large. Did you have any challenges uploading these data? Because um, these are all being served by Mapbox, right? Um, and how did you work around these challenges? That's a great question. Yes, we did have a lot of challenges. That was a very fun and interesting uh, engineering problem that the team worked on. Um, so these tile sets, um, get rid of the sources in here, right here. And while, you're, while you're clicking on that, these are all vector 100%. We're not yes. looking at raster tile sets, right? Yep. Yeah, that's right. These are all vector. Um, and so the tile sets, um, I actually forget where to go in Mapbox Studio to, to show you the tile sets, but um, basically what we've done to make all this data fit in a data set is divide the world up into regions. And so you can see here um, some of this, that you can see that there are these regions that we've created, like region North America, South America 7, um, region EU, um, uh, AF, so Africa 9. And so these regions are divided up so that we don't hit um, layer limits in Mapbox uh, tiling service. And so that way, uh, we were able to actually use two tile sets for every map. So we have an east and a west. And then within each tile set, um, we have these regions divided out. So you will notice uh, that as well when, if you get into um, our tile sets page and link to our uh, inventory again uh, and look at our Mapbox tile set IDs. You can see that they are divided. So for, for one map, you have two tile sets. So yes, that was an interesting uh, challenge to figure out how to do that. And it's, it sounds like, if I can just add on to that, it sounds like um, you, this isn't like a continuous pipeline, right? So you've this is mostly stable, and the only reason it would change is if the model actually changes or if there's some new, uh, new attribute added or something like that. Yeah, great question. We think about versioning and how do people manage this in their own infrastructure. So um, each of there's a scheme to each of these tile set IDs. So probable futures first, then the ID number, then whether it's east or west, and then V3. And so we just do a simple versioning. We thought about whether we wanted to do semantic versioning or something. We just kept it simple with simple version. Um, this is our third version of these maps. Um, and we do have a map history page where you can learn more about our past version. So if you go on the bottom left of any map, you'll see the version that you're actually viewing. And if you click on that link there, it will take you to a map version history page. And anytime we publish updates, you will see the version, um, what changed specifically right down to stuff like the model, the models that are used and specific changes that were made within there. Uh, and if you're really interested in using past versions of maps for any reason, we don't delete um, past tile sets. Um, we, we did when we were in development mode, but now we don't anymore. And so you can actually go back and look at old, older versions of maps. So you can see in the, there's a query parameter here that says map version equals latest. If I change the word latest, which will always just, of course, go to the latest. But if I change it to a particular number, like map version equals one, this is going to load the first version of this map. So you, you actually have access to everything um, from past versions of maps um, from updates that we've made to the data so far. Awesome. OK, and with that, I think we're at time. So I'll take us out. But I wanted to say thank you, uh, Peter, for this in-depth explanation of all these great valuable resources. Um, thank you to Probable Futures for um, for your partnership with, uh, you know, continuing to use and celebrate Mapbox products and for putting on this webinar. Uh, and everyone who's joining us today, I uh, hope this was educational and useful. Uh, any final, final words for the group, Peter? 
I don't think so. Thank you so much for having me. And please feel free to reach out by email or um, check out our documentation. I'm happy to help with anything you're working on, even if you just have a question or um, you want to bounce around some ideas, please feel free to reach out. Thanks for your interest. All right, excellent. Uh, join us again for the next Mapbox webinar. Stay tuned uh, either via the emails you get or check out our website, and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.